uh, there is not much change. Of course, there is some very little, very insignificant change. Maybe in some advanced Western countries like USA, the number seems to have reduced somewhat significantly. Whereas in other condition, countries, it's not much reduced. But there is some change. Whether this change is really worth of all that uh, uh, these uh, monetary uh, these advances and so on is the one thing. Now, a real game changer in the case of acute uh, cardiac pathologies is a cardiopulmonary disexpression. A discussion about heart diseases would never be complete without discussion about CPR. The CPR procedures, of course, now these are well known. The whenever there is a sudden cardiac arrest, the thing which really changes the total scenario would be CPR, identification of a person with the cardiac arrest and timely intervention of CPR is necessary and I think protocols of the CPR you people will know so I will not go into that part as such but CPR is one of the issue and now because the CPR has become a part of a public education in general public education and uh, it's considered like uh, the CPR technology should be known, CPR techniques should be known to every person in the society. The number of such uh, acute death incidences uh, might have slightly reduced or many of such complications might have been managed much better. Incidences uh, are reported as such like where it is, uh, uh, the outcome has become changed. Right? So that's one of the important issues. That's about the Vasudeva and its management, ischemic heart diseases. The next type of the Hridroga would be the Kapaja and Hridroga acid. That, uh, and I would consider this as a, the cardiac pump failure conditions. Again, cardiac pump failure conditions are those situations where the heart is not able to pump out all the blood coming in. And the typical presentation of Kapajasa Droga according to the Samhitas would be the Charaka Sana, it describes the Kapajasa Droga being the presentations of Kasa, Shwasa, Balakshaya, Kanthashosha, Ploma, Karshana, Jihwa, Nirgama, uh, then Mukhapala Shosha, Apasmara, Unmada, Pralapa, Sittana, Shadeha, Sivu, the different varieties of the uh, narrow system symptoms as well as uh, the systemic symptoms of dryness in the mouth, cough, breathlessness would occur. In Vagmata, the typical presentations are Shreshmanashdayam Stvangdham Bharikam Saashmagar Bhavata There would be a hypertrophy of the heart. The size of the heart would be increased and it looks, uh, the patient would feel it as a heaviness in the chest as such and the heart would be presented as a, a hard mass or heart, heart would be felt as a heart mass, Ashmagar Bhavada, as if there is a stone in the chest, as if that kind of a feeling is felt by the patient. And Kasa, Agnisada, Nishthiva, Nidra, Alasya, Aruchi, Dvaraha, the other symptoms would occur in such conditions. And uh, 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 that's exactly the stroke was repeated. Okay? Uh, these symptoms are exactly seen in case of uh, the pump failure conditions like uh, the myopathies or so on. Now heart failure or heart pump failure is now defined as a, a situation where a cardiac function is a, fails to pump the blood at a rate commensurate with the requirements of metabolizing tissues. Any of that condition where the heart is not able to pump the blood in sufficient quantities to the tissues, that's considered as a pump failure. And it usually uh, are with an elevated diastolic feeling pressure. When there is a stagnation of the blood in the heart, that too is considered heart failure. So heart failure could be of two categories. One, where there is a, a insufficient oxygenation of the peripheral tissues due to the inability of the heart to pump properly or there is a stagnation of the blood in the heart and that clinical presentation is exactly that of the Kapaja Hridroga. The clinical presentation of a heart failure or what we consider as a heart failure. Uh, of course, heart failure could be again either due to the peripheral causes or congestive cardiac failure. In both the conditions, the clinical presentation would be quite wide varying, and uh, the identification of the condition is always uh, challenging in the early stages. 
once the condition has become full fledged then the diagnosis is easy but early diagnosis early identification is one of the important issue the classical clinical symptoms of a congestive cardiac failure the typical congestive cardiac failure where the peripheral factor also would be there but typical presentation would be having exertional dyspnea or dyspnea even at rest and very specifically arthropnea that the patient developing the presence in the lying down posture typically in a very standard clinical uh, textbook presentation uh, or a description would be like the patient who uses multiple pillows at night because he is not able to lie down flat to prefer to lie down in direct posture the elevation of the head end would be absolutely necessary but that kind of a clinical presentation would be uh, presented only in the very advanced stages later stages not in the early stages so though that's a, a classical clinical sign from the practical clinical point of view uh, it's a sign that the patient has a very advanced conditions uh, then the other classical clinical symptoms are the pedal edema a dependent edema and the heart rate being increased tachycardia the other classical symptoms then along with that the other symptoms which should lead to suspect about it is vague symptoms of fatigue and weakness or chest pain where the patient may have palpitation anorexia weight loss nausea at times it could be the exophthalmos or pulsations in the eyes the patient may have feeling of a pulsation in the eyes these also are the other clinical symptoms which could be that then the advanced conditions again can present with acute pulmonary edema where that could be very rare acute uh, presentation of breathlessness even the oxygenation would be reduced patient even may have cyanosis conditions in due to the heart failure when it is acute and the distension of neck veins or jugular venous pulsations is the other characteristic clinical sign again which is seen in the advanced stages or very advanced stages the peripheral pulse could be thready or uh, weak as it auscultation sounds would be there could be either s2 uh, would be split resulting in what pulse s3 gara or pulses alternate irregular arrhythmias could occur or uh, the uh, even the first sound could be very low in such conditions variations of the heart sounds would be characteristic most frequently what we see is a, a very loud first sound or a split second sound could be the early signs of a, a congestive cardiac failure and uh, the patient may even have a hepatojugular reflux which could be presented in, in the presentation of hypertrophy of the liver with the size becomes bigger hepatomegaly could occur ascites also could occur generalized body or cyanosis or pallor could also be the presentation as such to make the diagnosis of a congestive cardiac failure there are many criteria now because the whole set of symptoms are quite wide varying and could be presented due to multiple causes there is a practical uh, identification issue the most popular criteria for identification or diagnosis of uh, the congestive cardiac failure is framingham criteria and framingham criteria lists these uh, clinical symptoms and when it is uh, categorized as major and minor categories the symptoms are categorized into major and minor and when there are at least two major criteria and one minor criteria then the diagnosis could be uh, as a congestive uh, cardiac failure or uh, initiation of a cardiac failure and then more the more and more the symptoms then the incident uh, intensity of a cardiac failure could be considered as a more prominent or more advanced so this criteria is very commonly used uh, criteria to make the diagnosis and in the framingham criteria list as such the major criteria are paroxysmal or nocturnal dyspnea weight loss of 4.5 kg in 5 days in response to treatment when you start with the uh, diuretics and uh, the if the weight reduced by significantly then that also is a major sign neck vein distension crepitations acute pulmonary edema hepatojugular reflux with the hepatomegaly the st gara that second sub split as such central venous pressure greater than 16 cm of water wherever it is possible to measure it 
and circulation time of 25 seconds or la, uh, longer that's when you put the pressure on the periphery the time taken for the capillary reflux capillary refilling uh, is more than 25 seconds now uh, when you press on the periphery there would be a blanching and uh, that blanched the moment you release the pressure the blanched area becomes normal color in patients of cardiac failure there could be a delay in that so more than 25 seconds is considered as a, a sign of circulatory failure if there is a cardiomegaly or a pulmonary edema seen on investigations like um, or congestion seen on investigations uh, or cardiomegaly atrophy if the patient has uh, died and then postmortem shows the cardiomegaly that is considered as a major criteria the major criteria is uh, uh, when the patient has uh, the symptoms of nocturnal cough, dyspnea and ordinary exertion, a decrease in vital capacity by one third of the maximum value recorded, the patient's total vital capacity is reduced, evidence of pleural effusion, tachycardia rate of 120 beats per minute, hepatomegaly, ankle edema, bilateral ankle edema, these are considered as the minor signs. Now, so criteria to make the diagnosis would be when there are two major criteria and one minor criteria or at least one minor criteria that would be enough to make the diagnosis of uh, congestive cardiac failure or uh, as such. But cardiac failure again is graded into four grades as such and uh, uh, this is again by the NYHA classification and uh, the class one is again uh, this identification at the early stage is quite important because the, if you have identified the conditions at an early stage, then the whole progression of the condition into a hopeless state or uh, prognosis can be modified significantly and hence identification is important. The, uh, this, uh, I, definition of these uh, four stages by NIJ criteria would be class 1 is where the patient doesn't have any typical clinical symptoms as such and the only symptoms could be uh, that patient may have shortness of breath while walking or climbing stairs etc. Those who feel breathlessness on climbing second floor as such or simply that they are not able to um, cope up with the, the exercise which is required otherwise or which is done by some other persons of the similar category then it could be identified as a class 1 congestive heart failure and this is one condition where a early identification is possible and a proper suitable measures taken even without formal drugs intervention simple exercise and uh, lifestyle modifications often can produce a significant change in that condition where you identify the uh, heart failure the beginning of the heart failure at class 1 stage Class 2 stage is mild symptoms and the patient may have a mild shortness of breath and slight limitation of uh, activities. The person is not able to do the normal activities. At times it is not only the mild shortness of breath, breath even there could be mild endine like condition. This also is a reversible condition. Class 2 condition also is reversible. Class 3 is when there is a marked limitation of the activity due to symptoms like uh, even during less than ordinary activity, patient may have breathlessness, uh, breathlessness developing even walking on a short distance like 20 to 100 meters and comfortable only at rest. Now this condition is a, a situation where you need an active, active management and a continuous active prolonged management can produce a, a significant change in the outcome but the patient needs to be on treatment infinitely. Class 4 is when the, there is a very severe limitation and the uh, symptoms would occur even at rest and most of the times the patient is bed bound and in such conditions the prognosis becomes poor. The evidences of cardiac uh, failure at early stage and maybe would be the most important dependable would be signs of cardiomegaly. Cardiomegaly when you take x-ray the cardiothoracic ratio is increased, the cardiothoracic ratio is uh, a ratio of the diameter of the chest and the diameter of the precardial shadow at the lowest level or at the widest level of the cardiac shadow and it should not be uh, the normal should be 1 is to 3 and when the ratio is altered the degree of ratio alteration also would be suggestive of uh, the possibility of cardiac failure so enlargement of the heart yeah. is the initial most sign 
evidence of a possible heart failure. So bigger the heart, the chances of heart failure is uh, more. So that's one of the important issues. Then the other issues are about the ECG changes. The ECG changes which can predict about the cardiac failure at early stage could be quite very very. And they are uh, may be of different categories like uh, pre-wave abnormalities that uh, that it's not that these are sequential, but any of these symptoms could occur because a cardiac failure could occur due to multiple causes and hence the ECG evidences which could predict about a cardiac failure at an early stage would be quite wide varying and it could be like P wave abnormalities where the P wave would be long and RP by I'll show you an example of all these abnormalities uh, try to present with that abnormalities in the consequent slides or long PR intervals and atrial ventricular blocks, or it could be a short PR interval, or atrial fibrillation, or QALs, or QRS complex in the high or low voltages, and QRS fragmentation, or epsilon waves, or bundle blood blocks, or ST segment and T wave changes, where the ST segment depression could be more than 0.2 millivolts, or T wave inversion in the precordial leads and ST segment depression in it lateral leads also could be the initial signs or ECG signs of a failing heart. Now, the I will try to show you the example of each of these, like a wider P wave or P wave abnormality could be either P mitral or P pulmonary. These are the two categories. P mitral is caused by the left atrial enlargement and uh, often due to mitral valve stenosis, the underlying pathology could be there could be valve stenosis which has resulted in the cardiac failure and typically the P wave may have present as a either hump like appearance, enhanced and hump like appearance and usually that second hump could be either highly positive or second hump could be negative. Whereas uh, and that's considered as mitral, whereas P pulmonary is caused by right atrial enlargement. So atrial enlargement is often difficult to make out clinically. Ventricular enlargement can be easily made out clinically by either palpation or auscultation. And the atrial enlargement often is difficult to identify clinically. And hence the ECG and pattern of the P wave is quite important. In a P pulmonary, the P wave is quite prominent and the particularly V2 and V1 leads, the P wave amplitude is quite high uh, in such conditions is considered as a P pulmonary, which is due to right ventricular enlargement. The typical presentations would be a P pulmonary and a P mitral where it will be basic. Again, show you some example of that uh, uh, mitral, P mitral where there is a, a, a left atrial hypertrophy and the left, right atrial hypertrophy where the P waves are spiked as such, spiked P waves is characteristic. So that's uh, one of the possible clinical signs which can occur. Then the other clinical signs which could be suggestive of a ventricular strain that where the heart is um, not able to pump properly, it could be where the PR interval could be quite longer. The time taken for the activation of the atrium itself is uh, quite longer. It's uh, normally it should be within 0.34 seconds if it is more than that. A longer PR interval typically is a, maybe a sign of a, the initial sign of a hypertrophy of the atrium. Now, this uh, uh, ECGs are quite important because this also is a sign of an atrial hypertrophy which is uh, not able to be made out clinically by simple auscultation. Auscultation often misses this and hence the ECG would be quite necessary. And in these conditions, the PQ, PR interval would be more than 0.34 seconds and that time would be a uh, evidence or uh, the sign of early stages and most of the times this delayed PR interval could also result in AV blocks and the blocks would occur the longer the PR interval the chances of the block could be more and AV block could be of different degrees patient may present with AV atrioventricular blocks of different degrees a first degree block is where the patient would have a regular rhythm seen that uh, every wave produced from the sinoatrial node uh, may not reach to the AV node and the AV node would be functioning at its own rate as such and the PR interval is uh, 
may be either within the normal range or may be longer and this prolonged PR interval is the classical sign and is resulting in a irregular rhythms as such. The ventricular rhythm would be normal, the P wave rhythms would be abnormal or uh, not synced as such. There will be no synchronization and this is a maybe the early signs which we also call as a first degree block and it could be uh, leading to the more serious issues later on. Second degree away block is also called as Winke back uh, block where the ventricular rhythm becomes irregular. The, this is more dangerous. The P waves, certain of the P waves may be reaching to the ventricles, the AV node. So that's uh, the SA node stimuli at certain area it reaches and certain areas it doesn't. So there could be irregularly irregular rhythms as such or maybe regular irregular rhythm. And the pattern of the QRS complexes, they would be at irregular intervals. P wave would be at its own rhythm at maybe a higher rate or lower rate. Since some of the P waves fail to produce any QRS complex as such, and that P wave may have altered pattern. And this is a situation where uh, the condition becomes more pronounced and uh, there is a uh, high possibility that the heart is not able to pump out sufficient blood. And a uh, treatment should be uh, necessary. And if at all there is a suspicion, then a atropine given can atropine can be used for confirming that there is a block or not. Atropine being a, 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 a parasympathetic blocker drug, it stimulates the SA node more and the AV node it doesn't have much of effect. So when atropine is given, these abnormalities become more pronounced in the condition. So second degree AV block or mobile type block also could be identified by uh, maybe at times by giving a test small dose of atropine as such. Then type 2 there is another variety uh, again more it is a suggestion of more advanced type of the AV block uh, that PR interval effect itself where the ventricular rhythm is highly irregular but atrial rhythm seems to be regular at a faster rate. Rate is typically ventricular rate would be less than 60 minutes, uh, 60 per minute and uh, P waves may seem to be normal and they, they, many of them may not have the QRS complex corresponding it. QRS interval may not be very high as such can, but it may be around within that normal range of 0 0.04 seconds to 0 0.1 uh, seconds as such. This also could be another of the condition but here also the atropine can be used but it should be used with the very caution as such. Then a yeah, third degree AV block is a situation where the ventricular rhythm also is regular, atrial rhythm also is regular but the pulse rate is at a very low rate of 60 or even less than 60 and uh, P waves are not really seen or they are almost merged with the QRS complexes and uh, this is a situation where there is a complete block as such and these patients of complete block may not have this acute clinical symptoms. The clinical symptoms may be very mild as such uh, and uh, the only the issue is that these patients would not be able to cope with the increased demand due to of exercise. Persons would not be able to do the exercise. Resting conditions they may seem to be normal. So severe bradycardia with the regular rhythm is the base clinical presentation of that uh, AV block. So that's about the possible clinical conditions which can lead to heart failure and uh, which can be identified by the ECGs. Then the other variants which can produce the or which can predict about the cardiac failure is a shorter PR interval. See, that's a very interesting issue. PR interval being longer also can result in uh, or maybe a suggestion of a heart failure a shorter PR interval, less than normal, less than 0.21 seconds, also could be resulting in uh, the uh, PR, uh, uh, maybe a sign of cardiac failure, which often occurs due to severe electrolyte imbalances. Most possibly, the patient would have a, a hypokalemia, the potassium level may be lesser in such patients often, or there could be the other causes. Myopathies also can present with the same short PR interval where the excitation would become more or there could be already the heart muscles will be excited. Of course, that pre-excitation condition we will discuss when we discuss myocarditis. In the next coming classes, we will discuss myocarditis where 
we will discuss more about that pre excitation issue uh, now anyway uh, due to that hyper excitability of the atrial muscles the uh, conduction becomes faster and this uh, faster conduction results in a reduced filling of the ventricle and hence there is a possibility of a, a pump failure as such then the same uh, continued further the, if there is a very rapid conduction there could be atrial fibrillation atrial fibrillation is when the rate is uh, more than 130 or 168 per minute now a patient with the atrial fibrillation presenting with a block can survive but if the atrial fibrillation results in a ventricular fibrillation where all the impulses produced from the SA node reach to the AV node 2 then there could be acute fatal complications patient may have a sudden death as such so that sudden death issue is another issue but atrial fibrillation presenting with a block the patient can survive and this also can later result in a pump failure and they typically in that patient either the rhythm is irregularly irregular most of the times the irregular is irregular and ventricular rate could be very high and P waves are not identified this atrial fibrillation also could occur due to multiple causes like electrolyte imbalances it could be excitability of the heart like myocarditis or even it could be due to simply a very thick or very hypertrophied significant hypertrophied heart muscles also can result in fibrillation then the q wave is a, another of the possibility which is usually suggestive of ischemic pathology and q wave is a, a, is mentioned as a negative wave which precedes r wave so before the r wave if there is a negative one that suggests you have Q wave and which suggests about a ischemic changes in the heart. So if the blood flow to the coronary vessels are reduced, even before there is an infarction, it may present with different changes. And of course, that part we have already discussed in the previous session. But again, the, from the point of view of a, a progressive heart failure, a evidence of a Q wave seen could be one of the precursors. And the, there you have to suspect about ischemic pathology and the patient may require a treatment for cardiac failure. Now another classical ECG signs of cardiac pump failure would be a very high Q, uh, QRS complex. The QRS complex amplitude in V1 plus R, uh, that um, amplitude in V5, the S amplitude in V1 plus R amplitude in V5, so S amplitude in V1 is a, that negative wave in the V1 and we are uh, we five the positive wave. If these are added together, if it is more than 3.5 millivolts, that's 35 milli uh, this uh, 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 the, uh, this chin sections, right? Or R plus S in tricardial lead is uh, more than 4.5 millivolts. That's more than 45 segments over here or R in V5 or V6 is more than 2.6, more than 26 millivolts. Any of these features could be suggestive of a, a very significant ventricular hypertrophy and this could be resulting in, resulting in a pump failure or a, could be the precursor to the next stage of a pump failure where there would be massive ventricular hypertrophy. Most of the times the cause for the, uh, this massive hypertrophy could be a pre-existing hypertension. Untreated hypertension is the most common cause. Of course, ventricular hypertrophy also can occur due to any of the other primary pathologies where the total volume of the circulation is increased like anemia, renal pathologies also can result in ventricular hypertrophy. Now, QRS complex with the low of voltages also could be the sign and which is usually due to the compressive disorders where the heart muscles are not able to uh, expand fully like myocarditis, constrictive pericarditis or even uh, the effusion in the chest like pleural effusions and so on. Injuries of the chest wall also can result in a low voltage conditions where the heart is not able to expand and then it's quite obvious like when the heart is not able to expand fully the amount of the blood flow to the periphery also would be affected and this also can result in a heart failure conditions and the when there is an evidence of amplitudes of all QRS complexes in the limb leads are less than 5 mm or amplitudes of QRS complexes in the precordial leads are less than 10 mm then that is also a sign which can be considered as a low voltage condition and that could be uh, and of course 
one of the other issues in low voltage is uh, patients having obesity. The, because the fat tissue is a bad conductor, many times even if the patient has a normal cardiac function, the voltages recorded in the ECG could be of a low category, so that fact has to be ruled out. But otherwise, low voltage category could also occur due to the pathological conditions as I mentioned earlier. Then another quite important issue of a cardiac failure, where the cardiac failure has been, heart failure has become established. The obvious evidences of a definite heart failure would be when the QRS has become fragmented and the total QR interval has become wider as such. So QRS complex is uh, uh, split into, that peak would be split into two and again that could be presented as a different modes as such, either RSR mode where there will be a small S wave and then there is a small uh, R dash wave, R dash wave or RSR R dash wave where there could be a small R, big S wave and then another small R wave or a small R wave and then another big S wave and then another huge R wave as such or it could be notched where there could be wide facing or there could be R wave only which is notched or there could be fragmented and this also is called as epsilon wave. This kind of a presentation is named as a epsilon wave where you will have a Q R wave then the S segment has become split as such. So the, any of these variations could occur and these are a definite evidence that the heart is not able to pump the blood properly and that also could be evidence as such. Then bundle branch blocks of different categories also can be a precursor to the cardiac failure. Now bundle branch blocks could occur due to multiple causes due to a previous infarction or even changes of electrolytes as such, even it could also occur due to the irritation of the muscles, myopathies also can result in bundle block block and it could be as presented as a left bundle or right bundle branch block. Now bundle branch block uh, evidences these, uh, first line is about the normal ECG, second line is the left bundle branch block, uh, third one is the right bundle branch block where the QRS complex becomes widened. The QRS interval becomes wider and the shape of the QRS would be either more towards the left side or more towards the right side. When there is a right side shift, it's uh, the right bundle branch block as such. So that's uh, the evidence of bundle branch block which also can result in a, uh, maybe which also can be a, a evidence of a possible uh, the heart failure. Heart failure also could be produced as a complication of chronic ischemia or even acute ischemic pathologies and the chronic or acute ischemia can also present as a ST segment elevation and an acute ischemia where during the immediate evidence of cardiac uh, this acute uh, this coronary blockade the initial stage would be presented with the hyperacute usually in minutes to 2 hours by about 12 hours the ST segment tends to become elevated and uh, the Q wave may even develop in due course of time as such and ST elevation would occur by around 2 to 3 days or 3 to 5 days as such uh, where the ST elevation would occur uh, or it could be ST depression. So that ST elevation myocardial infarction and non-ST myocardial infarction we have discussed in the previous session so again I will not repeat much. But whenever the patient has an evidence of a ST depression or ST elevation, though the patient may not have a evidence of clinical signs of cardiac pathology, we will have to consider this as a possible risk or maybe a progression into the cardiac failure as such. So that's about the confirmation of the diagnosis of cardiac failure. As far as the cardiac failure management is concerned, the first approach would be non-pharmacological therapy. Always prefer to have non-pharmacological therapy instead of giving the drugs where the uh, maybe if necessary uh, the positive pressure ventilation the patient ha has to provide more oxygen, uh, breathing exercises or even CPAP may be necessary. Restriction of the sodium and the fluid in the diet, physical activity which is appropriate to that patient and weight gain has to be restricted. So by these many of the conditions can be uh, reverse vaccines. As far as the drug therapy is concerned, the uh, usual initial most therapy before the patient has a sign of failure would be diuretics. 
diuretics would be helpful. Then the classical drug, a cardiac glycoside, a specific drug would be digoxin. So we will discuss about the pharmacology of digoxin in detail in coming session, uh, these uh, issues uh, as such. Because that's one of the crucial drugs. The, if there is any specific drug for the congestive cardiac failure, it's only digoxin which is a very specific drug. All the other drugs could be supportive depending upon the patient's condition. As I told you, the heart failure could occur due to multiple causes. So the drugs which could be used in case of heart failure could be other drugs along with the digoxin or without uh, this, uh, uh, without that would be depending upon the condition like vasodilators, inotropic agents, anticoagulants, beta blockers, AC inhibitors or uh, is, uh, these angiotensin safer blockers or nitrates or natriuretic peptides that uh, allow the sodium to be excreted out or uh, uh, the I inhibitors and new drugs like uh, uh, guanylate, uh, cyclase stimulators, these are the new drugs coming up but none of them are as effective as a digoxin. Then even surgical treatment may be necessary depending upon the patient's condition. It could be either electrophysiological intervention where the patient may have a severe arrhythmia where you may keep a, a pacemaker or maybe the other way that where the whole conduction could be modified. The revascularization procedures like either stents or bypasses could be there or valve replacement or repair if there is a valvular obstruction. Ventricular restoration, ventricles uh, would be you know, remodified by surgical intervention or even extracorporeal oxygenation is the other way where, or uh, what we call as artificial heart acid. Then there are lots of devices which can assist the ventricles or heart transplantation or artificial heart could be the other way. Now that's about the, in brief about the management of cathodial growth the possibility. Now, because digoxin is one of the drugs which is essentially used and uh, you will get plenty of patients who are being on digoxin, certain of the facts you have to know about it. So I will try to go into that uh, a bit in depth about the pharmacology of digoxin. Other drugs you will not bother. Digoxin is a alkaloid of plant digitalis perfusia. Now from Ayurvedic people now they have, though such a drug is not mentioned in Samiras, People have <coughs> named as Hrithpatri. I don't know whether such a drug is mentioned in any of the Samhitas or not. But anyway, digital is perfidious plant and it has many alkaloids. <coughs> Digoxin is one of such alkaloids uh, which is used as a the cardiac drug. So the most popular cardiac glycoside is a Digoxin. Now Digoxin is one of the oldest of the drug used in cardiac pathology. Of course, digitalis as a plant was used in Roxy historically in West, uh, many countries for the treatment of edema, generalized edema, Roxy. Whereas uh, even digitalis could also be considered as, or may be used as a toxic substance, or poisonous substance also, that digitalis perfida plant was used as a poison also uh, to kill either animals or even to the human beings, homicidal purposes elsewhere. But digoxin as a drug was approved by FDA in 1954. So rather it is considered to be the oldest of the drug uh, which is used as a cardiac stimulant and uh, for the cardiac failure. Digoxin has an advantage of positive inotropic and negative chronotropic drug. Now inotropic means which enhances the tone and uh, the contraction, strength of the contraction of the muscles. And the chronotropic is the rate, the rate becomes reduced but the strength increased and the indications mentioned in the FDA during approval would be treatment for mild to moderate heart failure in adult patients, increase the myocardial contraction in children diagnosed with heart failure, to maintain control ventricular, uh, maintain and control ventricular rate in adult patients diagnosed with the chronic atrial fibrillation. These are the indications. Uh, mentioned by FDA in 1954. Of course, the, at the present situation, the modif uh, these indications may be slightly modified, but basically the indication is uh, in cardiac failure. When there is a heart pump failure, digoxin is the only drug which can uh, improve the cardiac function directly. So there is a, a, if there is any specific drug for the heart failure, it is a digoxin. The pharmacological mechanism of action would be 
the digoxin acts upon the sodium pump. That sodium pump is a the enzyme sodium potassium ATPase. Uh, sodium potassium ATPase is enzyme, and that enzyme is regulated, which results in uh, the uh, flow of sodium and uh, potassium across the cell membrane of uh, myocardial membranes. And this inhibition of the sodium pump increases intracellular sodium as well as increases the calcium level in the myocardial cells. It's very important the myocardial cells, the calcium level increases when digoxin is given. And this results in increased contractile force of the heart. Heart becomes more contractile. And the ejection factor, the ventricular ejection factor increases. And that's how the heart pump is a, uh, a benefit. The ideal dosage of uh, is uh, digitalization or digital therapy. Again, there are a lot of uh, confusing issues. Uh, earlier, there was a practice of using digitalization dose, like initial dose, loading dose was uh, suggested. But currently, that has become ruled out. So earlier, in the 80s, the practice was to start with a heavy dose, uh, digitalize, and then maintain a lower dose. But or what we call as maintenance dose. But uh, now that schedule has been changed. Now it is always like start with a lower maintenance dose and uh, try to adjust the dose as such. And the usual ideal dose is considered as 0 0.125 milligram or 0 0.25 milligram <coughs> orally or IV per day is uh, the usual prescribed. And uh, the maximum dose. Uh, 0 0.375 to 0 0.5 milligram are largely needed. They are not usually given, and usually a lower dose of 0 0.125 to 5 milligram per day in a patients with the renal function, uh, impaired renal function, or lower body mass is always preferred. Thin patients is always preferred. The major risk with the digoxin dose is uh, is uh, the margin between the effective therapeutic dose and the toxic dose is quite low. The therapeutic range is 0.5 to 2 nanograms per milliliter. The ideal target should be 0 0.1 to 1 nanogram. So, whereas the toxic range is 2.5 nanograms. This is one of the issues. And another quite important issue is that half life, biological half life of the drug is 1 to 3 days. And when the digoxin is given for a long duration, there could be accumulation of the drug. And that accumulation of the drug can result in a higher concentration which even can reach to the toxic rate though the dose is same and uh, the, like lower dose is uh, given there is a possibility and hence now once the patient's condition becomes stabilized usually digoxin is given with a gap in the sense usually it is given on six days in a week so one day in a week is uh, uh, given up so that that accumulated drug can be you know, reduced, though it may produce a slight fluctuation in the concentration of the digoxin. So, standard practice of prescribing digoxin is that uh, till the patient gets a stabilized daily dose, and usually this is done with for uh, two to three weeks, then one dose in a week or two doses in a week are missed based upon the clinical presentation. That's one. Another quite important fact which you have to know is that. Uh, the bioavailability of the drug varies from brand to brand. So, digoxin may be presented with the different brands in the market. If it, uh, these, um, because it is a, a plant extract, the concentration of the drug in that brand would be lesser, may be varying. And every time you prescribe the drug, you have to ensure that the same concentration is given to the patient or the same brand has to be used. If you change the brand of that digoxin in the market, the bioavailability can change and that can produce a toxicity and hence the patient should stick on to a brand which is uh, already being used so that the bioavailability would be very bioavailability of the drug can vary from 60 to 80 percent in the tablets or 70 to 85 percent in the elixirs or syrups as such. Onset of the action would occur within half an hour to two hours and uh, the effect could be maximum effect will be seen by 5 to 30 minutes when it is given intravenously and uh, the uh, if uh, once the dose is given the effect can last for 3 to 4 days the serum concentration would reach to peak in 1 to 3 hours as such and uh, the drug is metabolized in the liver metabolites are uh, big oxygen in and uh, big oxygen in uh, monoglycoside uh, 
which is also active. Now this is the uh, mono digit oxide, uh, oxide is also active and uh, it can produce the same effect as it helps patients with the renal pathology and this is excreted through the kidneys and if the patient has a renal pathology there could be accumulation of the tetecoxidine in mono uh, digit oxide and that would enhance the cardiac activity and the toxicity could be precipitated. So that's why it's important. The major amount of the excretion would be through the urine, 57 to 80% are excreted through the urine. And this is quite related to that, uh, the metabolic product, metabolite of uh, digoxygen in monoglycoside. And the half life is one to three days. The quite important adverse effects are, the uh, common adverse effects are disease, mental disturbances, diarrhea, headache, nausea, vomiting, rashes over the body. The quite important facts should be known is that patients with the consecutive pericarditis or patients who have undergone electro, uh, this electrical cardioversion, either pacemakers or uh, the patients who had that ECT therapies, or severe bradycardia and severe heart failure, pulmonary disorders, sick sinus syndromes, ventricular severe tachycardia, ventricular premature contractions, Wolf Parkinson White syndromes, electrolyte imbalances, hypothyroidism, and hyperthyroidism, hypoxia, these conditions, renal diseases, and administered along with the diuretics, it should be very cautiously administered. The toxic effects could be triggered in such patients. So when you administer, when there is an absolute necessity, you will have to administer a decoxin even in these patients. But a continuous observation is necessary. There is always a possibility of a sudden development of a the cardiac uh, arrest in such condition. Quite a very most important issue is uh, intravenous or parenteral calcium should never be given in a patient on digitalis. Digitalis and calcium intravenously can produce a cardiac arrest in con constriction and it can produce a fatal immediate death as such. So whenever, if at all you are administering the intravenous calcium uh, for any patient, before you administer that, Confirm that the patient is not on digitalis or digitalis like drugs, that's important. And the patient with acute myocardial infarction, though the patient may have a congestion, this digitalis is not recommended. Only once the patient has become stabilized, the Q waves have gone, but the ST segment has become either depressed or elevated, then the digoxin could be given. In a patient of myocarditis, it should not be given. A patient who has sinus node diseases or AV blocks, there is a risk of sudden complications of death can occur. Digoxin pregnancy is another of the important issue because cardiac failure in pregnancy also is a common pathology and because the pregnancy requires more pumping activity, even many of the latent heart failures could become quite pronounced and hence the digoxin can be given safely. But digoxin can have the abnormal or adverse effects on the fetus and uh, can be show it crosses, crosses the placenta and amniotic fluid and hence the child born should be observed clinically for digoxin toxicity like cardiac arrhythmias, bradycardia and omitting in the newborn could be the presentation which needs to be managed immediately and the dose requirements in pregnancy uh, may increase during pregnancy. A patient who is on digoxin during pregnancy, the dose of uh, digoxin may be required high. And when you are giving that higher dose of digoxin, serum digoxin level should be monitored regularly before and after the delivery. So that's uh, one of the important issues. So digoxin in pregnancy, it requires certain extra care than the others. And uh, the risk, risk of developing arrhythmias also may increase during labor or delivery as such. Digitalis toxicity is uh, one of the important issues. The most important sign of the digitalis toxicity is bradycardia. The usual uh, caution is <coughs> a, patient of, a patient on digoxin should never be allowed to have a pulse rate of less than 65 minutes or maybe at times in certain textbooks it is considered as 60 per minute. <coughs> anyway, lowest permissible rate, uh, heart rate would be 65 or 60. If the level goes below that, then you have to interrupt the dose. The dose has to be stopped there and uh, reduced. Um, you will have to give it, uh, this um, gap, one or two days gap and then again start if necessary. 
then it may cause any dysrhythmias, any sort of arrhythmias could occur. Dysrhythmias in the sense, some part of the heart could be affected, uh, functioning prop, uh, in a different ratio, and another part is producing a diff uh, contraction in a dis different ratio. And these dysrhythmias are one of the causes, digitalized toxicity signs. And uh, the, it also can present with the, the AV conduction abnormalities. Sinus bradycardia and AV conduction blocks are the other most common ECG changes in uh, uh, digital toxicity, particularly in pediatric conditions. And uh, non paroxysmal tachycardia uh, heart, uh, with the heart block or ventricular tachycardia also could occur. The classical ECG signs of digitalist toxicity, initial most, most common, uh, initial most evidence would be ventricular by Gemini. Where the, there would be a sinus rhythm and the, there could be preventricular uh, contractions somewhere uh, uh, in between. This is called as ventricular bigemini, which could be the earliest sign of the digital toxicity, digital toxicity seen in the ECG. The same can present with the atrial tachycardia and uh, AV blocks also could be a presentation of the next level. In the next level, there could be atrial fibrillation and a pronounced AV block also could be a sign of digital toxicity, which is usually a sign of more advanced condition. And very serious digital toxicity, high dose of digital toxicity is uh, present with the atrial tachycardia, where the atrial rate could be very high, like 100 to 150 acid, and high grade second degree AV block also could occur with the premature ventricular complexes, highly irregular, and that can be quite fatal, and this has to be avoided. That's about the cautions you have to take when you uh, administer uh, digitalis. Or, it could be immediately fatal, or uh, a very risky condition would be, when there is a complex tachycardia uh, with the significant uh, alteration in the axis of 100, uh, from the 180 degrees, uh, that's very significant changes in the axis at the different levels, uh, which could be immediately fatal, within a short time the fatal complications can occur with the digital toxicity and that's also one of the issues which you have to keep in mind. As far as the ayurvedic prescription in a case of congestive cardiac failure is concerned, I would prefer Thunderbolt Bhavati, Punarnamundur and Trupha Karavati as a prescription, maybe along with the other drugs which are used. With this we uh, conclude today about the Kapha Jahardoga and congestive cardiac failure. Next, we will discuss about the picture of the which is an inflammatory pathology like myocarditis as such. See if there are any questions, right? There are no questions.